Okay, so what we are going to do today is go through input output so that we are comfortable with uh, how we can read and write things, which is of course an important part of the homework. And then from that we are going to slowly move into doing stuff for uh, uh, lecture four. So lecture four is slightly different than the way we did last year. Last year the ordering of these lectures were slightly different. So if you in fact are looking at last year's homeworks and uh, labs, you're going to see that there's a little bit of difference because of we've changed the order of things. Okay, so this is what we were doing. We were reading, we were learning about reading and writing. So what I want to do today is write a few programs and then I will uh, post these also as examples then we can actually um, see all the different ways of doing the same thing. So one of the things that we will see today is when you're writing programs, you also have to write them in a way that is easy to read, not by you, but many people. So some of these are actually conventions that you will learn. So one of the things that we learn is that if you put a string in the beginning of your program that explains what your program does, that basically is kind of a convention that helps people see um, what this program is about. So any string that you write in the very beginning is not actually part of the program because it's just a string. It doesn't do anything. You don't print it. So this is generally kind of a convention to write a comment about what your program does. And frequently you need to write, you know, purpose of the program, author of the program, and what version it is. But for this class, I am not going to work on those. I'm just going to at least describe what the problem I'm solving is. And sometimes we're going to talk about how we are solving it as it becomes more and more complicated. So let's try simple stuff and then we will get more and more fancy. So I would like to write a program that reads the first name and last name of a person and then prints it in one of two ways, first name, last name, or last name, comma, first name. And you know, this is basically very simple stuff, but let's start with that. So I will first need first name and and I'm going to need a raw input. And generally, you always need a prompt. So let's say first name. So if you are writing a homework, one of the things that you have to get used to is every time you read something, you have to print it immediately. This is just a convention for the homework. So you have to get used to it. It is not needed for any other program. It is just because of the uh, environment we are using for Python doesn't allow us to do certain things. Exactly. So what I'm printing out is exactly what I read. Who was saying that? Yes. So this is what we would like ask everybody to do in the homework. Everything you read, if there's a raw input, whatever you read, print it immediately after. For this, you don't need it, but uh, I'm just writing it so that you remember it. Okay, so my first uh, part is that I am reading first name and last name, and I have a prompt, and then I print it immediately. And you can actually try it. Okay, so um, what type? What data type is first name and last name? String, right? Raw input always returns string. Okay, so what I wanted to do was actually print first name space last name. So what I can do is I can print first name, a space, and a last name. Okay, what is the plus sign? String. What is the operation called? Concatenation. Right. So what this does is a little uh, simple, but still important to discuss. It will first construct a string that is the result of this expression of first name plus space plus last name. Then it will take the resulting string and it will print it out. So. 
All right, how about the name for me? John Smith? Stephen Colbert? What was the third one? You have to make it easy on me. All right, I'm going to do Stephen Colbert. But uh, that's just, uh, OK. All right, so what if I wrote this? Instead of this, I printed first name, comma, last name. What would that do? So remember, whenever you put a comma, it always puts a space anyway, right? So okay. it does produce the same exact result. And the second one is that I want to print last name, comma, first name, right? So, so I need to do last name plus comma and a space and first name. Okay. So now I have name, space, um, name, comma, space, name. Would it work the same way if I did this? So if I had print, last name, comma, and first name. There will be an extra space between last name and a comma, right? So I'm going too fast. Okay. So they are not the same, because every time you put a comma, there's a space. So even though there are different ways to do it, they are not all identical. You just have to know how to do all of them. There is a third way to do all of this, is to actually construct a string in which you specify places where other values are going to be plugged in. So you can actually do the following. So you can say, I am going to put a string here, a space, and another string. Okay. So this is a little different. In this one, I'm basically telling you that I have a string, but in this string there are two wildcards that I'm going to fill. The first one is, Anytime you see a percent, that means some other value is going to come. So the first one is a string. So whenever you want to plug in a string, that has to be a percent s. And the second one is also a string. And in between them, there is a space. So if you were to actually execute this, you would expect that this will fail. But this being Python and proving me always wrong, it, it should not fail. But it will probably fail just to uh, show off. OK, so if I provided nothing, it's just a string of percents. But what if I actually provided values? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a space. And now I'm going to tell what values goes to those two places, the percent %s and percent %s. So now here, very important, I don't put a comma because it's not print this and something else. It's print this such that the first percent %s should be filled with first name. The second percent s should be filled with last name. Okay. So what would happen if I put this, a comma here? So it will first print the first one, right? It will print the first one because it says, OK, print up to here. Put a space, then print this thing, but it doesn't know what that is, right? It already has this weekly syntax error line, so this will actually fail up to that point, right? So it will not run. So whenever you're doing this, you should actually use no comma, right? So this is part of the same syntax. And in fact, we can do the other one. That's going to be easy to do. But this time, I am going to have last name and first name. And I'm telling a percent %s, comma, immediately following, a space, and another percent %s, another string. So an important point to remember here is that this last thing we learned, which is called the formatted string, is actually nothing new. You can do all of that with string concatenation, but some things are going to get really difficult to do. 
So it just makes life easy for you by providing a shorthand. So this is kind of what we call syntactic sugar. It's not something new, but it's convenient. So this is the formatted output. Now, whenever you want to actually provide some comments about the code, write something that's not going to be interpreted as code, you generally put a pound sign or a hashtag before to tell that it is actually formatted output. Okay. So let's try another example. Okay. This is going to be a very simple one as well. And then we will get uh, much more uh, fancy. So I want to write a program to read the radius of a circle in float, compute its area, and then print it. Okay. So again, I'm going to read the radius. Okay. And I'm going to post all of these programs that I'm writing today online on Piazza, so you can find all of them if you are having trouble following up. Okay. So area is, what's the area of a circle? Pi radius square. Okay. Um, so we can actually say the area of a circle is an apprentice. Okay. So let's try this one. So let's say the area is 21.5. I got an error. Okay. So now let's try to learn how to read this error. Okay. When you first see the error, your first instinct is to freak out, right? Oh my God. So let's try to figure out what has happened. And over time, you're going to get good at it, but only if you try, okay? Only if you ever read these once, okay? All right, so it tells you here, this is where the error occurred. And I have a type error. So something to do with the data type. <laughs> <laughs> wait for it, wait for it, let everybody think for a second. It says unsupported operand types, star star, power for string and integer. Okay, so the problem is here in the power operation, okay, because this is where it says, this is where it, that it went wrong for you. In the power, there was a problem. Okay, radius square 2 did not work because you cannot have power of a string and an integer. Now, which one is an integer for sure? 2. So radius is then string, whereas we want it to be an integer. Okay, so you see you've gone far. Okay, now you have to figure out why that happened, right? But I want you to please once read the error message before you freak out. Okay? All right, so Python error messages are miles ahead of C++. So, you know, you have to build some resistance here. Okay, so why did radius become a string, not an integer? Yes. Right, because raw input itself actually always returns a string, right? So if I were to do it here, and then I uh, look at the value of radius, it is 23 as a string, right? So I don't know how to take the power of a string. So what I can do is I can do one of two things. I can do radius before I do anything else. I can convert it to a float, or I can do it in one step. So you can also do this. Whichever one is easier for you, both are fine. Once you get used to the first, you can move to the shorthand where you read. As soon as you read, you convert it to a float, then you assign it to radius. It just does the same thing. Okay. Okay. So now let's try it again. Okay. 
So now it does work. It says the area of circle is 17.26 something, something, something. But that's way too many digits after the comma. I don't care. Well, we don't know how to do that by just using strings. Actually, you can. Right? You multiply it. You subtract the digit. So you can actually do it. This is a good exercise. Try and do it. But there is actually an easy way to format floating point operators using the formatted string that we just learned. So instead of doing it this way, just to show you it's the same, I'm going to put here a float. So percent %f means it's a float. But you can also specify how many digits after the comma. For example, 0.2 means only put two digits after the comma. And then I'm going to say percent area because area is what's going to fill the float value. So here you have a wild card, and you have to tell what value fills that card. So in this case, it's percent area. So let's try again. Okay. Now you see what it did? What did it do? It did two, it did two things. It only showed you two digits, and then it rounded up. Right? Because it was going to be 299. 299 is actually 3.0, right? So it actually rounded up the last uh, digit. So, uh, so it's not going to be exactly the same, but this is going to be kind of the more pleasant way of printing it. Okay? So, any questions so far? These are all the different ways to read and write. Okay, but remember, whenever you do raw input, you're always looking at print. Uh, you're always looking at a string. Okay, so that's all we needed to cover from this. But let's go back to today's lecture, which is going to build on what we just did, but it's going to do a lot more things. So um, what we are going to do today and any time you see something different here than your course notes, you just scratch that CVS notes. Uh, CVS just means uh, Chuck Stewart. Chuck, I don't know what V is, but Chuck V. Stewart is actually the uh, person who was proofreading my course notes. All right. So one of the nice things about Python is that it comes with all these different functions where you can do lots of interesting things. But um, the important thing is that you have to learn what those functions are and exactly how they are called. And they are not always going to be identical, so it's going to be a little interesting. And part of it is because of the way language has evolved. And you just have to memorize it sometimes if it doesn't make sense. Okay? So we actually already know some functions. So functions are basically a piece of code that does something very specific. For example, we learned about, okay, so let's, uh, let's restart the shell, okay, so let's do, uh, is that correct? Let's put the name of a very awesome person. Okay. So um, one thing that we have learned is a function called length that takes a string and returns you the number of characters in it, right? Including space, new line, any other thing. All right. So the other thing we learned is that you can take a string you can concatenate something to it. So how many characters in name with new line? How many characters? So in name there were 19 characters. How many did I add? One. Okay. What would happen if I print 
three copies of this. It repeats it three times, right? Those of you who started the homework will get a clue there. OK. So, um, but there are many other functions. And sometimes Python has so many functions that you feel like every single problem I give you, you have to find a function to solve it. Ultimately, our job is not to really learn every single function Python offers. It's just learn how to use them to solve other problems. So don't really kind of get into the mind that you have to find and memorize every function. Please just memorize the three, four functions I show you here. And then you will be fine that you will be able to solve any problem. So uh, when I was young, there was a TV show called uh, MacGyver. None of you heard? Yeah? So the whole point is that he can take a Q-tip and then build a you know, shopping mall. So, uh, so this is kind of what we really need to learn. It's not like you have to memorize every function, but let's learn some functions and how to use them, and then that will build. Now, the string functions are called uh, in a specific way. So there are differences. For example, you can take a string. String is an object, and you can apply a member function to it. So, um, so, for example, you can take a string like name, and you can convert that to a lowercase. So you see how this is differently called than the previous one? Because previously we said length, in parentheses, you put the input string. Whereas when you do string lower, it just has the data type and then the function that applies to that data. Okay. So take the string that is in name, create a lowercase version of it, and return that as a new string. Is the name changed? No. Okay. All of these functions always return a new value. They don't change the original value. You can also take a name, make it uppercase. Okay. Let's do something different. So now I have name and lower name. You can also take a name, and then you can capitalize it. The capitalize will only capitalize the first character. Okay? It will not capitalize every single character. But sadly, there is a function for that, just to make you lazy. It's called Tidal. If you want to really capitalize every single one, it will capitalize every single uh, word in the string. Right? These are just four of the functions. Let's do a few more that are even more interesting. You can take a string, and then you can replace every occurrence of a single character or a sequ sequence of characters by some other one. Okay, so for example, I can take name and I can replace all the e's with. Um, let's try this. Okay, so you can replace a character, a single letter, with many. Or you can replace multiple characters. Let's try a different one. So you can replace, for example, so it will only replace the, the place IE with the other one. For example, I can never write Michael correctly. I've always switched. So this is a good way to get it back. Um, and you can also even do this. So you can replace all the E's with nothing. Okay, so basically the first string and the second string can be anything. It just says every time you play you find the first string in the member string, just replace it with the second string. And any of these functions that I have given you, you can call using a variable that has a string. Or it's string directly. So you can also have 
this. Okay. So basically, all of these functions take a string or a variable that holds a string and then applies the operation. And the operation itself is a function. And the function itself may have arguments, right? Upper lower has no arguments. But replace has two arguments. What to replace and what is the replacement value? So you can also use find. Find is actually kind of uh, advanced right now. I kind of regretted putting that. But um, let's just show it. For now, don't worry too much about it. But let's say. I want to find if the substring SS occurs in the string name. And if it does, it will actually give me where it occurs. The number of characters that uh, you have to count to see where that occurs. Why that is kind of confusing is that the first character of a string is actually counted as 0. You will see over time. So uh, in fact, So this S actually is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The fact that it starts at 0 is not relevant right now or important, so you can forget that. I don't think find it is particularly useful right now, but it will be in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, but if you actually search for something that was not in here, it will just return you negative one, seeing that there is no such string. Okay. You can also do two more things. You can uh, count how many times a specific character or substring occurs. So you can see that in Monty Python there are two O's. Or uh, or there are two A's in Abracadabra. If you wanted to search for AB, there are only two AB's. Okay. And the last one is the strip. That's going to be an important one. So you can take a string. Bless you. And then you can strip some character from the beginning or the end. So the idea is that given a string, sometimes you, you think that there are extra characters on the two ends. You can strip all of those by specifying Remove all the A's from the left and the right of the string and return me the remaining string, but not from the middle. So this will become very important when we do file processing. Okay? So this seems like a lot of interesting stuff. Let's see how many really advanced things we can do. Now I want you to really work on this with me, okay? because this will only make sense if you put some mental effort. You don't need a computer, but I want you to try these three exercises. So you are going to take a string like Amos Eaton, and then you are going to take the letter A, and every time you have a letter A, you repeat it as many times as there are letter A in the word itself. Then you are going to take a name, and then you are going to switch A and E. Okay, so wherever you say you see an A, you're going to replace it with an E. Whenever you have an E, you're going to replace it with an A. And then the third one is you're going to take some sequence of words. Okay, assume that there are no punctuations, but you are going to take it and convert it to a hashtag by removing all the spaces, making it a capitalized, and putting it a pound sign before. Now I want you to try all of them, okay? And then we are going to solve. This is actually what is about programming is putting all these functions together to do different things, okay? So let's try them, please.
for a couple of minutes. All right, let's try this. Have you got a chance to try all of them a little bit? I'm going to take that as yes. Okay, let's try them slowly and then see how you thought about them.
Okay. So the first one wants to take the string and then repeats one character A as many times as there are A's in the um, string. Okay. So first shout out to me, human megaphone. What are the functions that come to mind when you do this? So I heard I heard count. Do we agree count is a good function? Because I need count to find number of A's. Find the number of A's, thank you. Then I need what else? Replace. Replace to take an A and then replace it with multiple A's, right? Do I need something else? Well, how can I take an A and make it multiple A's? Multiply. Multiply. Okay. So your first step is to go through and figure out what are the things you might need. This is not going to, you know, result in the solution because now you have to put them together. Okay. So let's try to sketch a solution and then see if it works. So I'm going to take name and I'm going to replace what? Okay, I can count first. I can do it in one line. But I can do the count of how many A's there are. Okay, which should be two. So then I am going to replace the A's with A times count. Okay. Does that change name? No, it returns me a new string. If I wanted to change name to be this, I would actually have to say name is equal this, right? My claim is that you can actually do this in a single line as well, because what you can do is you can take name, replace A with the count of A's in, okay, so this is kind of the more advanced version that you can actually take functions and then put functions inside functions, so that would also work, okay. Okay, so how about the second one? The second one says that I need to take a name and then replace the two characters with each other. So, uh, so the comments uh, from my proofreader said that, hey, this is, you should provide a hint, right? Because the first time you see this, this is difficult. But you know what? I've been doing it for many decades, so now to me it's very obvious. But the first time you see this kind of you know, it's confusing. For example, let's say that this is name two. Ultimately, what function are we going to use? Replace, replace right? But the thing is that if you do name two dot replace, replace A's with E, okay, right? And then I'm going to later replace E with A. Well, what happens? Right, so I don't know which one was an A before, which one was an E uh, before, because now if I'm going to change E to A, so if I take this, and then I replace the E with A, this is what I get, which kind of is nice, but, but not really uh, right. This is because that you probably had to teach every single relative do you have how to spell Rensselaer, right? Did you also get it that you're going to Rensselaer and they said, oh, are you going to register? Did you have that one? Yeah. All right. Uh, so, okay, so this will not work. Okay, so this is a very common problem, right? So you cannot just replace it like this. You just have to have a middle step. So you have to probably take one of them, A or E, and replace it with something that cannot be inside the string, then replace the other one with A, and then this other thing back with E, right? So what, what I want is, for example, replace A with, what do you want to replace A with? 
I can replace it with a number because there should not be numbers in the name. Okay, so I replace a with one. So all the a's are gone. So now I can replace e with a. No problem. Now what do I need to do next? Replace one with e because no more e's left, right? So that's what I'm going to do. So this is name two. So I am going to take name two and I'm going to replace all a's with one. Okay. Then I'm going to replace all e's with a's and then I'm going to replace all one with e. Okay. All right, so if you wanted to really see, let's write it down here, okay? So um, let's put this here. Okay. And one of the things that I did, okay, so this is an important thing that you should try, is I gave myself a plan of what I'm going to do. So I put a little comment of what I'm replacing what with what, right? So that this way, when I'm writing the code, it's not going to get confusing because I have a plan, right? All right. As silence, I also have a plan, so I'm going to do it. All right. So this is what my uh, program does. Okay. And that's how it works. Okay. And then, let's save that one. Okay. And then the last one was, take a word, have you seen the pictures of this? This is actually a, apparently an RPI uh, mascot and it's really scary. All right, if you haven't, go on Reddit and check it, check it out. All right, so I want to reduce that to a hashtag and in the hashtag, every word is capitalized, okay? And, um, and there's a hashtag before and there is no space. So what are the functions I need? So I have this word and I want to do first what? I need to capitalize every word, right? So I need to convert every word to a title. Then I need to remove spaces, right? So I need to get rid of spaces. So take every space and replace it with nothing. And then I am going to add a hashtag before the word and that's what's going to look like right so the real problem is now you have to figure out how to use all the functions we've learned bring them together and create something new so this is where you are now solving problems using all of these different uh, functions any questions so far So my advice to you is, first figure out what functions you need, make sure you know how to call those functions, and then start trying to put them together and build it one step at a time. You didn't actually have to do all of that in one step at a time. So eventually you will see that people will do these things in one step. Is that possible? Sure it is. So you're going to do something like, uh, take the word, make it a title, take that, the result of that, apply the replace, and then put a pound in the beginning. Okay. So you can do it in multiple steps, you can do it in one step. What is the advantage of multiple steps? 
Readability, yes, thank you. Okay. Why not make it readable for the TAs, the mentors, and a very important person that we should never forget? You, you from 10 minutes from now, <laughs> right? I will tell you, sometimes I find things that I've done and I thank myself from, let's say, two months ago. So um, make sure that you always take care of you from the future. All right. So, of course, there are not only string functions. There are lots of numerical functions. And we will see a lot of them. So we already know some of them. We already know integer and float, right? We know how they work. Um, integer is basically works in multiple ways. Integer will basically truncate a value, right? So if you did have a value, no matter what the value is after the comma, integer will always return you the integer portion of it. Okay? But uh, round works a little differently. Round will round it up or down, depending on what the number is. If it's up to 4.5, it will round down to 4. If it is 4.5 or higher, it will round it up to the next. And round returns a float, right? Round is just rounding the value and returning you a float, which you can truncate using an integer. Okay. Whereas the integer itself returns an integer value, and it will always um, remove anything after the comma, regardless of what it is. Another function that we are going to use a lot until we learn if statements is min and max. So you can take any number of values and find their min or max. Now, if some of you have programmed before, you will immediately ask me about lists. Just forget about it for now, please. Okay? Uh, just a max is a function that can take any number of values. And why that is possible, we will see in a couple of weeks. And the same thing you can do with min. Given any number of values, it will return you the minimum of these values. So min and max are going to be very useful. We will learn to use them in many different ways. And the absolute value will always return you the positive value. Um, positive, positive version of a number, right? The absolute value. Okay. So um, now one of the things that you saw is that all of these functions are available to you when you start Python from scratch. So this is what we call a built-in function. Okay. Sometimes you will see this convention. Anything that is a uh, you know internal Python name, it will actually start with start with two um, underscores like this, right? So all of this stuff that you've seen, all these functions are part of what's called a built-in. So you can actually see what are the things that are in built-ins. Built-ins is actually name of the main Python, the main Python program, which we will refer to as a module. You can see what is in it by doing help. Okay, And this doesn't actually stop very well, so let's try this. Okay. So you can see the types of things that are in built-ins, things like um, all of these different classes. We have just learned integers, and we have just learned strings. This should be here somewhere. And then all of these different functions and so on, you know, we can learn a lot of these, but we don't need to right now. In fact, there are lots of functions that apply to a specific data type. If you wanted to see what they are, you can actually write this, right? Anything that you can do to an integer, you can find here, right? So you can take the absolute value of x, you can add x, 
you can find bitwise and you can do a comparison function. Okay, this is too, too advanced for now. You can find the float and so on and so forth. If you want to find everything that you can do to a string, that doesn't sound so well. All right, so you can see help str, okay? So this is something you can learn that it will actually tell you all of that. So let's do a small example using these functions, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more, okay? So let's go back to one of these, okay? So I want to write a program to read three values, and then I want to find and print their average, min and max. Okay, so that should be familiar to you if you read the homework, but you actually don't have the min and max. Okay, all right, so, so I'm going to read three values by simple raw input. Then I want to find the average, okay, so I'm going to find the average by taking value 1, value 2, value 3, dividing by 3, and then I'm going to print the average value is average, okay. So there are many ways we can make this better, and uh, this many eyes are looking at this program, so some of you may be already uh, objecting to stop in it. Do you want to see and see what happens? Okay, let's see what happens. So I'm going to have one, two, and three, and then I have an error. What is the error? Raw input reads a string, whereas I need numbers. Okay, so I should actually convert to a float. Okay. okay, so now that seems to work. What if I uh, entered something that was not a float? So uh, what if I entered A? Well, the problem is that we don't know how to solve this one yet. So we are going to uh, figure this out, but not right now. So in the homework, you can assume that all the inputs are valid. So, okay. And what if I actually write this a little nicer because average is a float, so I want to actually format it like this, like this, okay? So, um, okay, so now that looks nicer, okay? And I also want the min and the max, so I'm going to find print the min value is... Okay. Now I'm going to have to print the min value here, right? So first I need to compute what that is. So all I need to do is val1, val2, and val3. And I can do this magical thing called cut and paste. So I can do now the same thing with max. Okay. All right. Now, here's a challenge for you. I want to find average of the smallest two values. You cannot use an if statement. You will always want to drop back to something that you know and comfortable but you actually learn when you are actually uncomfortable. That means you're doing something new, okay? So in fact, you don't need if, and this will be faster in theory, um, modulo, uh, you know, Python being uh, slow. But uh, how can I do this? Just think for a second, okay? Think for a second, how can I do this 
without an if statement. But just using what we have already in this program is enough. So I want to find the average of the, the, the smallest two values. Give it a second. Then I will ask. Okay, so please do think. Okay, all right, so let the uh, wheels turn. What's happening? So, if you want to find the smallest two values, then you want to find the average of smallest two values. What if I want to add the smallest two values? How do I, how can I do that? Right, so I can add the three values, right? So if I add, all right, okay, I know you know it, but I'm going to do, okay, this is all three of them, right? But I, I want to subtract from this, the maximum, then what will I have left with is the smallest two. Okay, so I am going to take and subtract from this the maximum. Okay. So now what I have is actually the sum of the smallest two values, which I can now take the average of by dividing by two, right? So, and then I want to give it a meaningful name like sum of the min two values, or actually average of min two, right? So, print average of min two values is. So let's try 1.2, 2.4, 3.8. Apparently, I cannot type. Okay. So the average min two values is 1.8. So it's the average of 1.2 and 2.4 is 1.8. Is that correct? So you see that you actually solve something by thinking a little differently about the same problem, right? So the more you do these things, the more comfortable you will become with all of the different functions. Any questions so far? OK, so now let's do something slightly different. We are going to get a little fancy. So these are all the functions that already come with Python. We said that they are called built-ins because they are built into the core Python. But the nice thing about Python is that it also has all these different outside modules that contain additional functions. And these additional functions are going to make you do things that you find quite amazing. Okay? Very, very soon. Yes? Power function is the same as the star, right? So you have power of 2, 3 is the same as this. It's kind of a useless function, because you already know how to do that one. So, um, so a module is basically an external uh, set of functions. Generally, modules can contain a function as well as a, a constant or a variable with a value. But you cannot use them in Python until you bring them into Python by loading them. That procedure is called an import. So you have to first import a module so that you can use stuff inside that module. So um, you can import a module called math. So now everything that is inside of math, you can use. This is one of the very basic additional modules that come with Python but are not loaded into the built-in, so they are extra. But you didn't have to install it because it comes with Python. So if you wanted to see what was in math, you can do this. A whole bunch of stuff is in math, right? Let me try this here. This one is better. 
So I'm going to import map. Okay. So the math contains all these functions, the trigonometry that you all lo love and could not get enough of. Um, if you are engineers, you have to love it. So you have exponentials, factorials, floor, um, log, log or you know log of any base and truncate, and you also actually have the value of pi up to a certain precision and the value of e up to a so certain precision. So if you want to use them in your program, you can access them by using mat dot the value. So for example, math.pi is a variable that's only defined inside the math formula, but it is more precision than you were using. So instead of using pi and defining it or just using 3.14, right, in like RPI, you actually can use the real pi value with more digits. You can also use a function that is in math module like math dot truncate. So what truncate does is the reverse of um, that should return. I guess it returns an integer. I'm surprised. Um, it basically works exactly like int. One function that you can use is square root. So you can find the square root of a value. and so on and so forth. So let's use some of these in our program, and then we are going to go and do some more interesting things. Let's go back to this function where our purpose was to uh, compute the radius of a circle and then print it. But I cannot do that. Um, I want to use the actual pi value with more precision. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I am going to first import math, okay? Because I want to use something that is in math. Then instead of this area, I am going to actually use math.py, okay? So now I have a slightly better scheduled, structured program. So it's the kind of the same function, except now I'm using something from a different module, I bring, in, I bring that into my program. Now, here where we have to start playing with program structure. As our program becomes larger and larger, I want you to start paying attention to how I write things in here. Okay? So I want you, over time, to start matching this. And by starting with homework two, I want you to start putting points you know, in program structure. So what is program structure? Generally, when you read a program, it has to have certain components. So the first component is this uh, command in the very beginning that tells me the purpose of the program. Often, I want to see your name as an author and other things. Then anything that you are importing, I want to see it up here. So any import function is in here. And if you are importing multiple modules, they should be all up here. Okay. Then I'm going to have my program. Generally, my programs involve reading something, computing something, and printing something. Right? So kind of think of your programs in this way. So I want to see these in this order. So read stuff, compute stuff, and uh, print stuff. So even over time, we are going to make this more and more sophisticated. But I want to see kind of at least this structure. So what we are going to do the next time is we are going to start with this program. And then we are going to actually write another program and a few others. But we are going to follow the structure. And then we are going to add a completely new type of uh, thing. We are going to write our own function. So please, please read the course notes and the book for functions. And then we will pick it up from there on Thursday. <laughs>